Whenever you hear that song, I would remind you to remember who wrote it. A young man in Ottawa, Canada, who lived literally in a one-room shack with his mother. They had nothing she took in laundry just to make their ends meet. But he had a great voice and he sang in church and one day a man from New York City was there and heard him. And He called up somebody from Nashville and from Hollywood and they came to hear this young man sing at church and they made him an offer. They said, you have a voice that is literally one in a billion and we want to take that voice and make it famous. We're going to make you the king of a vast domain. They said, you sign with us and every financial need you've ever had in life will be gone. And that young man said, well, I would like to, to put some heat in our house. He said, my mother's hands are always so swollen from doing the laundry. And they said, son, you're going to have everything. The only deal is this, you don't sing in churches anymore, you sing where we say to sing. Sign this and every worry you have is over. That night he went back and by a coal oil lamp, he showed his mother and she said, son, wouldn't you rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today? And he refused that contract. That young man's name was George Beverly Shea. And he sat down that night and wrote that great song. Thank you for that. That was heart touching. How many of you that spoke to your heart? It sure did to mine. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 14. The book of Mark. And then keep your finger there because we're going to go to John 13. John 13. Pastor, thank you for the great honor and the privilege of allowing me to come and be here. I love the spirit of your pastor and his precious wife and their family. I love the spirit in this church, and thank you for that great song the choir sang. That song, My Plea, that was wonderful. Now, I've said this everywhere. I believe in America it should be perfectly legal to shoot a bad choir. You ought to just be able to stand up and put them out of their misery, all right? You say, Brother Gibbs, why would you say that? Your preacher will understand this. A choir can dig a hole that no preacher can get out of. And boy, I love to watch these dear people sing, and thank you for letting all the wonderful, the beautiful motel room, and boy, the lady who did the fruit basket, God bless you. What a great fruit basket. There's no fruit in it. It is wonderful. <laughs> it's got my favorite fruit. It's got Hershey's and Snickers and all that good stuff in there. Boy, there's nothing worse than having to dig through the fruit to see if there's anything good in the fruit basket, <laughs> and uh, thank you for that. This morning, I want to take your attention to the life of a man that we don't preach on a great deal, but there's a profound and incredible lesson to learn from his life. He's a man whose name has gone down in infamy. He's a man who betrayed the very Son of God. And you say, Brother Gibbs, what could we ever learn from him? His name is Judas. I promise you there is a great lesson to be learned for every child of God from the life of Judas. You say, what could we learn from him? Let me tell you the lesson, then we're going to read it. Judas was with the disciples for three and a half years. Everywhere they went, he went. He had an incredible act. The disciples in three and a half years never one time suspicioned that he wasn't real. His act was so persuasive, it was so good, that he fooled everybody except for the Son of God. You know what the lesson is? If we're not careful, our lives can have a powerful act. We can pretend to be more than we are. We can pretend to be what we're not. And suddenly the question comes, are you real? Am I real? 
or are there parts of our life that are just a good act? Now, your act will fool me, and you may even fool a lot of people, but no one's act ever fools God. And the question this morning that I want to ask you is, are you, am I, real? God never called us to be great actors or actresses. And tragically, the greatest acts are not on a soundstage in New York. They're not in Hollywood. The greatest acts around the world are in churches. And are we real? Or is there some act in our life? Let's get ready to read the story about Judas here. The book of Mark, chapter 14, starting at verse 17. And in the evening he, that's Jesus, cometh with the twelve. Now, they're at what we oft refer to as the Last Supper. And in the evening he cometh with the twelve, and they sat and did eat. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him, Underline these next words, One by one, every one of the disciples said this. They began to be sorrowful and say unto him one by one, is it I? And another said, is it I? Whoa. Guys, it's Judas. Not one of the disciples thought it was Judas. In fact, when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, every one of the disciples said, is it me? Is it me? Judas was so talented, and he had such a good act. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, it's Judas. Oh, wait a minute, David. Judas has been with us for three and a half years. Man, when we fed the 5,000, he was there. I mean, he handed out some of the loaves and fishes and helped pick up the fragments. He was there when Jesus walked on the water. He was in the boat. He was there when Lazarus was raised from the dead. He was there when demons were cast out. David, you're telling me that he was not real? He was just an accomplished act. An act can be very powerful, but it's still just an act. Now go to the book of John, and let's see how John, in his gospel, records this. John chapter 13, we're going to be at verse 21. And let me tell you what's in this passage. John elaborates on this further. And when Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, Peter gets John to ask him, who is it? And Jesus said, the one who's going to betray me is the one I dip a sop with. And as we're going to read, he dips a sop with Judas. And even after that, the disciples cannot believe it. When Jesus had thus said, verse 21, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. And there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. Now, if you know your Bible, who is that? That's John. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, he it is to whom I shall give a sop when I've dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Boy, now get this. They said, who is it? And Jesus said, I'll show you. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought because Judas had the bag. Do you understand? That was the treasurer. 
and you don't give the money to somebody you don't think is real. You don't give the money to somebody you don't think is truthful. Because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said to him, to buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Jesus said, I am going to show you who it is, and they still can't imagine or believe who it is. The act fooled the disciples. How many of you do not want to be an act? You want to be real. Hold your hand up. Wow. That's the cry of my heart. Tragically, the world is full of people in churches with a good act, but they're not real. I want you to write three benchmarks down that the scripture says if we're going to be real, here are three benchmarks that will show in our life. Three benchmarks that we individually have to hold our lives up against, founded in the word of God. These three benchmarks are God's benchmarks of what's real. Write the first one down. Number one, the Bible says if you're going to be real, if I'm going to be real, we have to humble ourselves in the sight of God. James chapter 4, verse 10. No one is real who doesn't humble themselves in God's sight. You see, one of the tragedies we have today is there are churches everywhere, and I promise you they'll be in this community as well, where the whole goal is how to get God to help you get what you want. The whole goal is how to get God to serve you. And they never one time talk about humbling yourself in God's sight and you serving God. The first mark of reality in any of our lives is are we humbling ourselves in the sight of God? Now that command, humble yourself in the sight of God, is written in the continuum. That means do it and keep doing it. You only get saved once by asking Jesus to be your savior. But now that you're saved, humbling yourself is something you are to do on a continuing and an ongoing basis. When's the last time you bowed and said, Lord, search me? As the psalmist said, see if there be some wicked way in me. And you humble you in the sight of God. Uh, People whose life is an act have no trouble seeing what's wrong with everybody else. But they rarely see what's wrong with themselves. They're good at spotting what's not right in you, what's not right in me, but they don't ever want to turn around and put their finger on themselves. And suddenly the question becomes, how good are we, how good are you at humbling yourself in the sight of God. Life just has a way of suddenly molding itself around us. And God says, if you're going to be real, I want you to humble yourself and keep humbling yourself in my sight. The great evangelist D.L. Moody, perhaps the greatest evangelist that America ever produced, used to start his services by inviting people to the altar to humble themselves. And he would say, get your eyes off of others and get your eyes on you before God and you humbling yourself in his presence. Those of you that are married, have you humbled yourself with your mate? Have you humbled yourself with your family? Lord, we bow before you. And by your grace, we want to be clean. The Bible at 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, Brother Gibbs, 
I, I don't have anything to humble myself in the front of God. I, I'm telling you, I'm so perfect, I don't even know why I go to church anymore. I promise you, if you think that, you're wrong. Every one of us, every single day, has reason to humble ourselves in the sight of God. But when the act takes over, suddenly you're just comfortable with the way you're doing it. And suddenly we're not humbling ourselves. Oh, don't ever get to the point where you're not good at humbling yourself, where I'm not good at it because it is a Bible command, a Bible command. All through Scripture, God invited his children to the altar, not just people who needed to find God, but people who had found him who needed to humble themselves. And remember, when you go to the altar, you're not bowing your knees and your backs and your neck. Oh, we do that. But after a while, your knee and your back and your neck won't bend like it once did. But you can still humble yourself because at the altar, it's not your body you're bowing, it's your spirit you're bowing. And you come before God and you say, God, I bow before God you. Search me. Put your finger on anything in my life that doesn't belong there. Oh yeah, but Brother Gibbs, if I say that, God will do it. Yes, he will. And that's where reality starts. When we start recognizing it's not our act that's anything. It's humbling ourselves in the sight of God that's everything. The first key is you got to humble yourself in God's sight. Write the second key down. Number one, you got to humble yourself in His sight. Number two, you got to walk in the Spirit. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit. Again, written in the continuum, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, God says, I want you to humble yourself, number one, in my sight. And by the way, make sure you understand the Scripture says, humble yourself in His sight, not in our sight. I know, you can go to the altar and it's just a show. But when you humble yourself in God's sight, and then he says, walk in the Spirit. Now, written in the continuum, every one of us is to walk in the Spirit. And this is so incredibly important that God gives us the benchmarks to tell us if we're walking in the Spirit. He said, if you're walking in the Spirit, your life will show the fruit of the Spirit. Drop down to verse 22. We're to walk in the Spirit, and he said, if you're doing that, here's the fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is. Now, can I encourage you? Watch carefully. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit are. If you're walking in the Spirit, every one of these fruits will be in your life. You don't say, well, I'm good at two of them. I'm good at three of them. No, no, no. It doesn't say fruits, it says the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, wow, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Look at verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Are those fruits in your life? I was with my wife. We were traveling in a, a motor home we had at the time. And we were at a church on a Wednesday night. I was going to have the privilege to preach there that evening. And I didn't want our motor home to block their parking lot. So we were like down along the street. And the church sat up on a hill and their parking lot kind of swept up. 
And I'm on the phone with a, a lawyer and a judge on the West Coast, and service is going to start at 7 o'clock that night, and now it's going on 6.30, and my wife came over to me. She, she said, honey, it's, it's 6.30. It's 6.30. I said, I know, I know. And boy, I'm trying to get off the phone. Finally, she comes over and she said, honey, it's quarter to seven. A lot of people are starting to arrive. I said, I know, I know, I know. Now it's five to seven. And she said, honey, it's five of, and boy, they're really pouring in. I said, I know, I know, I know. Now it's seven o'clock and I'm still caught on the phone. My wife said, honey, you can hear them. They're starting to sing. And I said, I know, I know, I know. Finally, about five after seven, I get off the phone. I turned to her and I said, come on, hurry up, hurry up. You're making us late. You're making us late. Amen. Don't you look at me like that. There is nothing more evidence of an act than when you blame others. That's pure act. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Now, to get out of our motorhome, you got to go down a couple of steps we fold out. And they're kind of wiggly a little bit, jiggly little steps. And my wife has a bad knee and a bad hip. And she's, I said, come on, hurry up, hurry up, quicker, quicker. And she said, honey, I'm going. I said, no, come on, hurry up, hurry up. You said, where did love, joy, peace, gentleness. Where did all that go? When you are an act, the fruit of the Spirit will disappear in a heartbeat. Now we're walking up the parking lot and it's kind of steep and I'm saying, come on, quick, quicker. She says, honey, why don't, why don't you go on? I'm coming as quick as I can. And I said, no, 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 it won't look good if I walk in without you. Where did that come from? It won't look good. Well, I'll tell you what that is. That's act talk. Now we come up to the front and Usher opens the door over and I say, oh, glory to God, good to see you, good to see you. Right this way, sweetheart, right this way. And I had not said one kind word to her all the way up there. Now we go in and we sit down and the pastor says, come on up, Brother Gibbs, come on up. So I go up and sit by the pastor and I'm sitting on the platform. And man, the Lord spoke to my heart. And God said, you just treated Gloria Ann like trash. You treated her horrible. And now I suppose you want me to help you tonight. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, yeah, that's pretty much what I had in mind, yeah. <laughs> When you are a Judas, when you are an act, you will still want God to help you, but you don't want to change the act. Boy, I'm sitting up there and the Lord said, you need to repent. That night, oh, man, I stood up and I said, before I do anything tonight, you got to know on the way in here, I treated my wife horrible. We were late totally because of me and trying to work on a ministry matter. And then I just got all over her for it. And I told him everything. The only way out of an act is to start walking in the Spirit. Now, you're never going to walk in the Spirit if you won't humble yourself in the sight of God. So the first thing is you got to humble yourself. The second thing is, you got to walk in the Spirit. I have told the folks in our ministry, boy, if you don't see this fruit in me every day, tell me, tell me, tell me immediately. I've told my kids, if you don't see this fruit in me, tell me immediately. My precious wife, do you understand? These are commands of God. There is no such thing as a reputable Christian who isn't walking in the Spirit. These are commands. The first one is, I got to humble myself in the sight of God. The second one is, I got to walk in the Spirit. 
Write the third and final thing down. If I'm going to be real, number three, I got to grieve not the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4.30, and I got to quench not the Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Do you know what it means to grieve the Holy Spirit? It means to hurt him. It means to inflict pain and distress on him means to cause him discomfort. You understand, the day you got saved, some wonderful things happened. Your sins were forgiven. Hell's no longer where you're going. Heaven is now your home. And you're not going to heaven as a visitor. You're going to heaven as family for all eternity. It would be phenomenal if you just got to go as a guest, but you're not going as a guest. You're going as family. But there's more. The day you got saved, the Holy Spirit took residence in you. He's in you. You have him. Now what are you doing to him? And God says, don't you grieve the Holy Spirit. And don't you quench him. Wow. When you're an act, you will put distress and pain on the Holy Spirit on a nonstop basis because you're not being real. Brother Steve Kluth of my staff and I were invited to a men's retreat in the mountains of Idaho, great church, and it was a large men's retreat, and I said, Brother Gibbs, when you come, we just want to tell you in advance, this is a very manly men's group. And I said, right, manly. They said, no, I mean really manly. And I'm kind of like, what are we, wearing dresses? I don't know what you're talking about here. Well, we got up there, and boy, here they are with three, 400 men up in the mountains. And boy, it was manly. The first thing they did for these men was have a boxing match. And the way they did it, was they paired everybody off, and the way you won was when the other guy couldn't get up again. And they have no headgear. And I mean, they're bashing each other's bloody and noses and splitting lips and eyebrows. And I'm standing there watching all this, and the preacher said, you don't have to worry, we got, we got two doctors in our church that are up here, we'll stitch them all up, and we got a couple of paramedics. And they said, don't you want to get in a boxing match? And I said, oh, no, 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 no. And I said, boxing's not my thing. Sumo wrestling, that's my thing. <laughs> I said, if you want to do tummy bumping, then I'm in, all right? But I'm not going to be swinging a... I couldn't get over it. The second thing they did just amazed me. They did a paintball face-off. They took all the men, put them in two lines... And I'm going to guess they were probably 50, 60 feet apart. Gave them a paintball gun. Now they have no helmets, no chest protectors. Huh? Turned on high, and they're shooting at each other. Pow, pow, pow. One guy hit in the head, knocked him out cold. I thought, he's dead, he's dead. We don't need a doc. We need a mortician up here. Man, that guy's dead. They were killing each other. If you survive that, they move you in. And if you survive that, they move you in more. And I mean, at the end, they're not the distance apart from me to your song leader. And they're just going pow, and it's going pow, 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 pow. I thought, they're killing each other. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, that's nothing compared to the pain you've caused me. When you do that stuff, David, that you know I'm telling you is not right, take that. And God says, you stop it. Stop grieving. Stop hurting the Holy Spirit. Have you ever seen a mother whose kids are grieving her? 
what they're doing is hurting her beyond words. And that's terrible. But can you imagine we're doing it to God? We're doing it to the Holy Spirit he put in us. And God says, you stop that. Stop it. To quench, that means to try to put down the effect. You have a fire because you want heat, but then you don't want the fire anymore, so you want to quench the fire. So you know what you do? You put dirt on it, water, you smother it. And God says, whatever you do, don't you try to smother when the Holy Spirit is talking to you. Don't you quench him. When's the last time you walked into church and said, talk to me? I want to hear from you. I don't want to leave the same as I came. By the way, don't ever come to church with the thought of leaving the same as you've come. Because whenever we come in contact with the power of the Word of God, our lives should be changed. God says, I want you to be real. I was with some pastors and we were going to eat at a preacher's home and it's back when the playoffs were going on a couple of years ago and a couple of the preachers had teams in the hunt and while the ladies are fixing the food we're, we're watching the games at this huge screen this took up half the wall we're watching it and midway through the game, on came these cheerleaders. Now, these are not cheerleaders. They're not really there to lead cheers. Number one, they have next to nothing on. And they're dressed seductively. And they were on the screen writhing, and the cameras were trying to take shots to show them seductively. And here we are all watching this. In the middle of nowhere, the host pastor got up and turned it off. And he said, men, that hurts the Holy Spirit. That we would watch that hurts God. And he said, I'm sitting here and it's just not right. Now, I'm sitting there and I thought, you turned the game off. What are you doing? And boy, then he said, I promise you the Holy Spirit's not happy. We're grieving him if we're comfortable watching that. And I thought, boy, that's true. That's true. But it's so easy to get an act to get comfortable with what we know isn't right. Yes, Judas, boy, you're slick. You're slick. You fooled everybody. They were with you for three and a half years, and you fooled everybody. But you didn't fool Jesus, and you didn't fool God. And the bottom line is none of us fool the Lord. I want to encourage you. Don't live a good act. Be real. You got to humble yourself in the sight of God. You got to walk in the Spirit. And number two, you three, you got to not quench or grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I don't know what last week was like. But next week can be unlike any you've ever lived in your life if you say, Lord, I do not want to be an act. I don't want to be. How many of you have children? Hold your hands up. How many of you know kids are God's little spies? How many of you know that? I close by reminding you of this. Nobody, nobody can see an act quicker than family. They can tell when it's not real. Oh my, nothing but nothing breaks the Holy Spirit's heart like us pretending to be what we're not. 
Let's pray. Father, thank you. Father, by your grace, by your power, we want to be real. We don't want to be a good act. We want to be real. We want to walk in the Spirit. We want to humble ourselves in your sight. And God, by your grace, we do not want to quench and we do not want to grieve you. Heads are bowed. How many of you say, David, I know the Lord. Boy, I'm heaven bound. But God spoke to my heart this morning and I want to leave different than I've come. If that's true, hold your hand up right now. Hold them high. God bless you. God bless you. Take your hands down. I wonder if there's one here that would give me the privilege of praying for you. I won't embarrass you, but I would count it a great honor to pray for you. David, I'm not sure heaven is my home. If this were going to be my last day on planet Earth, I'm truly not sure where I'd spend forever. My friend, don't live that way. Because one day will be yours, it will be my last day, and a good chance we won't know when. David, I want to know heaven's my home. Would you remember me in prayer? I'd be honored to do that. I want to know that based on what Jesus did on that cross, that my sins are forgiven and heaven's my home. David, remember me in prayer. Slip your hand up right now, just right where you are. Is there one anywhere I want to pray for you? Oh, my friend, the most important decision you will ever, ever make is what you do with Jesus Christ. Is there one anywhere? Father, you saw the hands of the Christians. And Father, I didn't see the hand of anyone saying that they're not sure about heaven, but boy, if they're here, Father, don't let them leave. Oh, please, draw them. The most important thing in life is where they're going to spend forever. Forgive me, forgive us where we've too often just been a good act. We don't want to be a Judas. We want to be real. Help us now as we open this altar to be bold to come and humble ourselves in your sight. Amen. Let's all stand together. The piano is going to play. God spoke to your heart. I want you to step out and come to this altar for a closing word of prayer. You raised your hand. You said, when I raised my hand, I meant it. I want you to come right now. Don't hesitate, don't delay. And boy, whatever you do, oh, don't quench the Holy Spirit. God spoke to your heart, you come right now. This service is gonna be over in mere moments. Mere moments it will be done. Would you come? We'll wait just a second for you, my friend, would you come? Pastor. Father, I sure bow with these folks. Oh my. Forgive me where I've pretended to be. What you know and I know I wasn't right then. God, by your grace, we're called to be real, to be honest, not to be an act. We humble ourselves in your sight. And by your grace, Father, right now, we want to walk in the Spirit. Such a precious command, and we don't want to grieve, and we don't want to quench you. Hear the cry of every heart, I pray in Jesus' name. The altar's still open. I wonder if there's someone here that would say, David, I know the Lord, I'm heaven bound, but boy, I've never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. The first command that every child of God has after they've been saved is to identify with the Lord in baptism. Yeah, but Brother Gibbs, I, I just, no, no, there are no reasons to not. Boy, God spoke to your heart. You come forward right now. You've never done believer's baptism, you come. I promise you, God honors that in life because it's commanded in his word. And if you're here and you say, David, I want to join this church, what a phenomenal group of believers. What a great pastor, what a great church. 
What a wonderful place where the Word of God is exalted. David, I want my family to be united with something like this. I want to be united. Oh my, you come. We're going to sing one verse right now. We